the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Ad, episode 794 for Monday, December 23rd, 2019. <laughs> And if you're listening on Monday the 23rd, happy Festivus to all of you and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all of your questions, tips, cool stuff found, pretty much anything that comes in and process it, formulate it, craft it, hone it into an agenda so that for today we can have a Festivus for the geeks in us and That'll start with some cool stuff found because we love cool stuff found. And then we will have an airing of the grievances because mail provides for such a platform these days. But then regular questions, of course, and tips and all kinds of things. And even the mail rant, I think, will have uh, a, a little bit of help and tips because, you know, we all have to learn every time we get together. Each of us needs five new things sponsors for this episode include linode at linode.com slash mgg or promo code mgg2019 gets you 20 bucks to start we'll talk about why you want to do that shortly here but for now here in what has become quite frigid durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fearful connecticut this is john f Braun. how are you doing mr mr john f Braun today Good. We're uh, we're actually thawing out today. It's uh, finally above freezing. Uh, it was kind of neat. So we had like a, a ice storm, but not bad enough that it was like taking trees down everywhere. I think That's some good. places it was, but it was actually really pretty. But then as it started getting above freezing, yeah, the uh, trees and the power lines were were hurling ice missiles, <laughs> little ice missiles at the cars. It was, was kind of kind of fun driving around, and all of a sudden here, you know. You have you have an odd definition of fun, my friend. That that scares the heck out of me when there's ice missiles. That's bad, right? Well, actually, one of my uh, yeah, one of my pals actually did uh, had their windshield broken. They were driving on ID I eighty four, and I believe I think it. Yeah, one flew off of a truck and uh, shattered his uh, his windshield. Yeah, yeah. Remember to brush off your cars, people. Otherwise, you're gonna you could hurt other drivers. That's bad. Yeah, there you go. Well, see, there's your PSA for the day. There we go. Uh, We will start with cool stuff found, as I promised. Listener Chris reminds us of one that I think we've mentioned before, but it's been a number of years. And that is Cheat Sheet, which is a great little overlay. You hold down the command when you have this running in any app, you hold down the command key like you would to say invoke perhaps command C for copy, but just hold it down a little bit longer. Don't hold down the C with it. Like you're going to copy, just hold down the command key and up will pop an active, a a list, like an overlay of all of the command key shortcuts for the current application. Super simple, super handy. And that way you don't have to go digging through the menus to see what each of them can do. It's all just going to be right there. And that's from media atelier, and we will, of course, link to it in the show notes because that makes life way easier for all of us. And you can get the show notes uh, delivered to your email every week. It, just go visit MacGeekGab.com and put your email address into the form and boom, you're good to go. It's free and, you know, it gets them all right in your email. And we, well, uh, well as long as you don't consider that spam because that's what you're signing up for, we don't spam you. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, I remember mentioning that one long ago. Long and ago. I searched yeah. for it on my machine and I don't see it. But it says it works on 1010 or greater. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, I can finally mention my favorite, uh, current favorite pow- travel power adapter or, or power, power brick. Well, it's this thing from Anchor that I've had actually for several months. Uh, it hasn't been embargoed or anything, it just hasn't been available. So, I didn't want to tell you about it without you being able to order it. It's called the uh, Anchor PowerPort Atom 3 Slim. And what it is, is it it's this little um, uh, little little thing. It's 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 about the thickness of your iPhone and it's square, but not nearly as wide as your iPhone. 
right? So, and it's got three USB-A ports and a USB-C port with 45 watts worth of power delivery on it. And then it plugs into the wall. Super lightweight. It has lived in my travel bag, but of course it would be very much at home uh, on your desk or, you know, on your bedside table or whatever, any, anywhere you need to charge a lot of stuff. But for me, for traveling, this is fantastic because I just throw this into my travel bag and it's all I need because I can charge my laptop with it and I can charge all of my USB devices and it provides plenty of power because it's anchor. And so every port has power IQ and it does the right amount of power. And yeah, it's fantastic. It, I've been super happy with it and I've been bummed every week for the last several weeks because I haven't been able to mention it because it hasn't been available, but now it is It's on Amazon for $54 as of today anyway. So, and they've got them in stock. So there you go. It's a pretty good thing, John. And I think I would have to assume it takes advantage of the, the gallium nitrate technology to be as thin and powerful as it is. But, um, but I, but that's just me presuming whatever it is, it's thin and it is. Yeah. It's instead of using silicon. Know, mentions it. Yeah. yeah it's, gallium nitride. Nitride. Huh. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes all these new, especially power delivery chargers, thin and lightweight um, is, is that. So it's, it's awesome. Love this thing. So got to check it out. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool. And then from listener, Julie, Uh, We were talking, we have been talking about various different screenshot tools that let you screenshot an entire web page as one PDF, as opposed to uh, having to do, you know, a a screenshot of the window, then scroll down, then another screenshot, another screenshot. And she found a Chrome extension that she says she's been using for years called blip shot that does this same thing. And it's built right into Chrome. So uh, thank you, Julie. And we'll, put a link to that in the show notes any thoughts about that my friend mr braun no no cool it's good it's good from listener craig uh he says uh it was interesting to hear the discussion uh that julie in fact posed in episode 792 how to hook up dual monitors on a macbook equipped with thunderbolt 3 ports via USB-C. Like you, I was thinking, what is the complication? It should just work. Not knowing why she was having difficulty, he says, my first thought was, if it doesn't just work, which I think it does, uh, there is at least one specific solution from our good friends at OWC called the OWC Thunderbolt 3 Dual DisplayPort Display Adapter, which is at least currently on sale for or on clearance for 38 bucks or 39 bucks. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And uh, thank you, Craig, for that. All good stuff. I love it. This is, like, this is what I love about this show. So we can just get to learn and talk about geeky things that excite us. And, right? It's, it's, I look forward to it every week. So, yeah. Any, anything there, John? Nope. Okay. All right. Um, David has a question that then turns into one of the coolest cool stuff founds I've ever found. So he says, I've been pondering something for a while now and would like to get your input on it. I have an Xbox one S in my basement and the controller via Bluetooth works in my office 20 feet away, one floor up, but I have to keep changing batteries all the time. And every once in a while, the controller loses connectivity because of it. Sure. Rechargeable batteries work, but having them die in a game or match is not ideal. And random shutdowns are also a problem. So my thought is this, can I run a USB cable from the Xbox front panel port to a keystone port in my office, like a little plug port in the wall, uh, then uh, plug in a six foot cable from the wall port? He says, I've dug into this and the maximum usable distance I've found uh, for USB is 16.5 feet. But even that is not advised for something like this. He says, my thought was to get a small powered USB hub and mount it in the basement and then run another cable the last few feet to the wall port. Would this get me functional, and can a hub act as a signal booster, as I've described above? I don't think so. Um, I don't think a hub will do that. The good news is David sent his question in, but did not stop digging. And what he found is, I believe, not only his solution, but a solution for many of us, 
if, in fact, we run into a scenario where we need to talk to a USB device that is far away. I'm thinking of the 3D printer thing that we were talking about several weeks ago where you wanted to have a 3D printer in a faraway place that might have been able to be uh, connected via Ethernet because he found a monoprice USB extender over Cat5 uh, and it can go up to uh, 150 feet in, uh, and so this it's essentially two dongles that you buy one uh, they both connect to ethernet in the middle and then one has a, a female USB A port on one end and the other has a male USB A port on the other and so it effectively becomes this USB cable that has ethernet in the middle and of course ethernet does a decent job going over long distances so that's pretty cool. He hasn't tested it, uh, so we don't know. But, you know, seems like uh, seems like it should work. Pretty cool, huh, John? Yeah, I remember when we were talking about that. I think uh, here and there I found some wireless solutions to do that, but I don't think a wireless solution would be good for this. Right. Oh, yeah, no, that would be bad for this, I, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It was I. Uh, I actually recalled. So uh, remember Keyspan? Yeah, yeah. They actually had a device like this years ago, and actually, I'm looking at the box right now. Keyspan USB server, and it does exactly what I guess this other device did, though it's using older protocols. That so um, it's Ethernet and it has four USB ports. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Huh. Well, let's put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. I like it. I like it. That's good. Cool. Cool. Anything more on that one? Nope. All right. Nope. Cool. Um, I wanted to talk. It's, it's I'm surprised I have not yet mentioned this. Uh, the iPhone case that I've been using on my iPhone uh, 11 Pro since I got it. I mean, I've tested other cases as we've discussed, but the one that keeps coming back on it is from a relatively new company called grip to you. Their URL is prevent the drop.com. And what it is, is it takes the concept of having something like a pop socket on your phone, something where you can actually get a grip on your phone with one hand. That's, that's pretty solid. And it bakes it into the case itself. And the way it does it is by a rubberized strap that sort of sits flush with the back and there's a little bit of an indent in the uh, back of the case. So you can just slide your fingers under this. And then you've got this rubberized strap that sits and and holds your phone on your hand. But it doesn't get in the way when you're putting it in your pocket. It's charger compatible, like Qi charger compatible. And the case even has a little kickstand in it. So if you wanted to watch a movie or or read the news or whatever while you're you know eating breakfast or what have you, it it. Props your phone up in uh, in I, I don't think it'll prop it up in in uh, portrait mode. I haven't been able to sort that out, but it certainly will prop it up in landscape mode. It It's a it, they've got several, you know, of course, they've got several models. They've got uh, one that they call the boost case, which I'm actually not sure what that what that does, because I've been using the slim one, which I really, really like. So uh, it's worth checking it out folks i uh i highly recommend oh i guess no i haven't been using the slim case turns out i've been using the boost case because the boost is the one with the kickstand so there's a slim one that i need to check out so there you go but uh but yeah they make them in all colors and patterns and they even have some translucent ones and so yeah pretty good it's um uh, it's it's my favorite iteration of this that i've seen yet so and it survived a couple of drops and all that good stuff that's as phones do. So I was pretty stoked. Yeah. Good, John. Yeah. Okay. It's good for, uh, yeah, I've had a few phone fumbles. Uh, fortunately only one resulted in screen disaster. Do you put a tempered glass, uh, screen protector? No. Uh, I highly recommend those for exactly what you described. I had a, um, I've always put as soon as they came to market, whatever that was four years ago or something, when they just, you know, flooded the market with them and you can buy them cheap. You it, certainly if you want to spend 30 bucks on a tempered glass screen protector, by all means, knock yourselves out. But I have had good luck with the, you know, three for seven dollar ones that you can find on Amazon. So uh, so that's what I use. 
and they do crack and, and get chipped and that sort of thing, which is sort of their point. But I had a, a fall. I got out of the car and my phone, uh, you know, fumbled out of my hand. I think it was going to a band rehearsal somewhere else. And so I had like extra stuff and my phone just like flipped and it perfectly landed on an asphalt driveway. So rocky, you know, uneven surface but with lots of points face down. And I thought, Oh, yep. Okay. Well, it finally happened. You know, it's fine. I've, I, I've, I haven't paid iPhone insurance ever. So I've saved all kinds of money on that. Here's where I get to, you know, spend some of some of the money that I haven't spent. And, uh, and I, I picked it up and it was just like, it, you know, the screen was just shattered and I'm like, okay. And so I slowly, I went back to the back of the car cause I had to get some stuff out of the, the trunk or whatever. And so I opened up the hatchback and, I, you know, laid the other stuff down and I slowly, carefully peeled the, uh, the shattered screen protector off and the phone was totally fine. It's like, yeah, okay. This is why I put these things on there. That's why. So highly recommended. They feel good because they're, they're glass, you know, similar to your iPhone screen. So it's not like the plastic cheapy things that we had to use initially. So the tempered yeah, glass. And when it comes, and when it comes time to remove it, is that an issue? No, no. You just pick it up, just lift it up with your, uh, with your nail. Like I said, I did it. Um, oh, I, I, right. I removed mine and, and usually even when they shatter, you can usually get them off in one or two pieces. Yeah. It's no problem. It's no problem to, to get it off. Yeah. Easy, easy. It's a good question though. I'm, 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 I bet there's a lot of people out there that have hesitated to put these things on because of that. No, we well, that would be one of my concerns because if yeah. you're going to trade your phone in, they probably don't want all sorts of gunk and, and other stuff on the Screen. Oh, no, that's the beauty of it. When I go to trade my phone in, I have zero scratches on my screen because like they're the only ones to ever see the screen without a screen protector on. I order when I ordered my iPhone, whatever, 11 Pro, I immediately the next thing I did was I went to Amazon and I found, you know, screen protectors that were uh, that were for it. And so those arrived before the phone did. I took the phone out before I even set it up, wiped the phone screen clean pop a screen protector on it and it's been that way. I don't think I've replaced this one yet. My kids seem to be able to crack theirs within about 37 seconds of putting it on their phone. So they tend to live with, you know, a minor crack in their, in their screen protector for a while before it finally gets bad enough that they're like, Hey, can we replace it? I'm like, yeah, of course, just go in the drawer. We have a drawer at home that has a ton of them in it and they're welcome. They're welcome to use them. Any guests that come over, we always have enough for every phone shape and size. It seems so we're always happy to pop them on for people because they cost us about two bucks. But, um, but you know, mine, I, I don't, I guess I don't drop my phone as much as my kids do. So, anyway. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I had a, a drop event the other day. I, I put my phone down on a little shelf at the grocery store and the uh, cashier managed to push my phone and it fell on the ground. Nice. But um, but the case that I have, so I have one of the spec cases yeah. that advertises uh, drop protection and it worked. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Those spec cases are, are miraculous for drop protection for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. They know and the other doing. thing, if something terrible happens, uh, one of my credit card, actually, if I pay my bill, my cell bill with mm. this card, they offer, uh, I think a small deductible, like 25 bucks. It's a, it's a Wells Fargo card, but that was one reason I got that card. Something yeah. Like, hey, if you, you know, if you hurt your phone, we'll, uh, you know, and I think it's like up to 750 of, uh, up to $750 with like a $25 deductible. So, wow. Huh. So, uh, that's pretty so good. Check that out too, folks. Uh, your various credit cards uh, offer lots of benefits. This one just caught my eye when, yeah. when I signed up for it. So that's pretty good. I put a link to that in the, uh, in the show notes for us. Cool. Oh, All you right. found the, the card? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, Google found it. I typed in this is the beauty of using Google Docs for for, you know, sort of managing the show notes live so that we can well, a we can share them not amongst not just amongst us, but with anybody in the chat room at uh, MacGeekab.com slash stream, of course. But um, but, you know, you just type in I typed in Wells Fargo cell phone protection, 750 bucks as the label. And that's what you will see if you visit the show notes mm -hmm. at MacGeekab.com. And then you just highlight it. And I hit command K because that's the shortcut to make a link in uh, Google Docs. And when you do that, Google starts searching the web for the text that you have typed and it found it. And so I just selected that and boom, the link's in there. It's all good to go. Saves a ton of time. It's great. Super efficient. So hopefully yep. it got the right link, but I'm assuming it did. 
So Google's pretty good about that. Yeah. This one says it's uh, $600 worth of protection for, uh, oh. for 25 bucks or uh, with a $25 deductible. So, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But still that, that should cover all but the most <laughs> catastrophic. <laughs> yes, that's true. Events. That's true. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think a screen replacement. Oh, the last couple hundred bucks. One. Yeah. 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 Cause I had to do that from one that I dropped. I had Apple uh, replace the screen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, uh, so I got something cool, Dave. Yeah. Uh, I'm hooked up with, uh, these guys at Pepcom and, uh, they, they let me check it out. And I, I think it's pretty neat. It's the Moxie signal personal safety wearable. What the heck is that? You ask. Yeah. And I'll tell you what it is. It's kind of uh, not quite. You, you you had tried to quantify it. It's kind of like a, the I've fallen, but I can't get up. Well, it seems like we the, saw the, the corny like, commercials about. Yeah, it seems like this sort of the the, the technological uh, evolution of that product. Yeah. So here's how it works. It's pretty quick. So you get it. Um, it has an app. You pair it with uh, with Bluetooth. Actually, the first unit I got wouldn't Bluetooth. I think it had older firmware, but the second one did. And so that's great. So out of the box, um, but, and then you add contact information when you set up the app. And I just set up myself, but you can add other people uh, who are concerned about the whereabouts of the person who has the device. Uh, if you run the app, it'll locate them via GPS. So you can see where the person is at all times, kind of like, you know, find my uh, or or whatever they call it now, um, you know, find my iPhone or the evolution of that. But then it has three modes. So there's a button on it. There's also a mic and a speaker and lights. You press the button once that does a check-in. And what that'll do is send a notification to the contact or contacts. Uh, it can also email and send a text. So that's the one mode. And that's just, you know, say, hi, I'm okay. Yep. And uh, when it's received, I think the, the device will make a, a noise indicating that the, the person that, you know, is concerned about you has, has uh, received that. The second is what they call yellow alert, and that'll do that. But what it'll also do is record audio in the area that the person is in. And then you can later listen to the audio to kind of figure out, well, why are they doing a yellow alert? So that's mode two. And then they have a red alert mode that does those two things, but then they also have a bunch of people that are sitting by the phone. And if they get a red alert, they will actually get in touch with you uh, to talk about, you know, what's happening because they, they'll be able to hear the audio as well. And you guys can decide what to do. And, you know, I guess they would call 911 or whoever sure. needs the help. Um, oh, the, and the last thing is that it, at yellow alert and above, um, you actually get a map, but you also have the ability to chat with the contacts do wow. a, a text chat. So you can all say, okay, you know, uh, you know, what's it? Oh, well, the other about, contacts. I see. Oh, got it. Got it. Cool. Yeah. And you can do it either through the app or, you know, it sends a URL and you could do it through a browser. So you can have a chat with the uh, contacts listed for that person. Makes that's, sense. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's so cool. um, you can do a payment plan or it's, it's 120 if you want to buy it. And then I think the service, because it's doing, you know, LTE through uh, T-Mobile, I, I think it's 15 bucks a month for the uh, cell service. So huh. for somebody who, you know, you want to know where they're at and yeah, I mean, I could think for, you know, caretakers and, uh, you know, or kids or whatever. Uh, it seems pretty neat. Cool. Cool. I like it. Yeah, that's good. Sweet. Thanks, man. Uh, I found a cool thing this week. I've long been a fan and user of Pixelmator and and now sort of the, the next version of it, which they call Pixelmator Pro, uh, an image manipulation app. I use it to create all of our Mac Geekab artwork. Of course, it can do far, far more than that. I'm very, a very rudimentary user. But they added something this week called ML, short for machine language, super resolution. And what this does is normally when you try and zoom into an image or resize an image to be larger than its source, things get very grainy. Uh, you know, there's some algorithms that they can use to sort of try and smooth it out, but it's going to get blurry and all that stuff. <laughs> right. But uh, enhance. Exactly. Right. Like on so TV. <laughs> it, we watch these TV shows. Right. And zoom enhance. Yeah, exactly. This does that. 
I, like, on your computer, you can do this if, as long as you have Catalina. I think it requires. I think Pixelmator Pro just in general requires Catalina. I could be wrong about that, but I'm I'm pretty sure it does. And it's freaking amazing. I did some tests with it with uh, faces of like the staff. We have some images on the site that are just naturally small images. And I tried it with the normal, you, you know, kind of whatever bilinear uh, algorithm. And I was like, yeah, OK, that's what I'm used to. It's pixelated and blurry. And then I tried it with this one. And it, it like it was freaking amazing, John. It's totally uh, it, it. I mean, if you have to do this thing all the time, my advice would be, well, maybe get better quality source images. But for those moments where you do have to like zoom something in that you don't have a better source image for this, it's, tr it's fantastic. I was really blown away that it just works. And that's sort of the beauty of machine learning, right? They were able to take all of these various pictures and then zoom them. And it learns about patterns and, you know, all of that sort of big data thing where it's just, you're just t dumping tons and tons of examples in, and then the machine learning engine, uh, uh, you know, learns from those and can extrapolate to apply those same sort of patterns to uh, to other images. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's well, well worth playing around with it. And it's it's free as part of the, the you know, sort of regular updates to Pixelmator Pro. And I think Pixelmator Pro, I can't remember how much it is. Um, I, it's less than I think it's less than 50 bucks. I want to say it's 40, but. Uh, yeah, it is. It's forty bucks, thirty nine ninety nine in the Mac App Store. So there you go. It's it. So, go ahead. So how do you how do you enable this? Um, it's just up. Oh, just do the update, and it's there. There, there's two ways to invoke it. If you have Pixelmator Pro, uh, there is. I believe it's in the. Do I have it open on my Mac here? I don't know that I do. Um, I don't like to open apps while I'm uh, podcasting, but I will for you. I will do this. So in the image menu of Pixelmator Pro, there is now an option called ML Super Resolution. But, oh, there it is. Okay. but it's also in the image size um, uh, sort of uh, widget, if you will. So when you go to resize an image, you now have four algorithms to choose from. And one of them is this ML super resolution. So you can you can do it that way or you can choose one of the other three. So and and depending on your image, you may like the results of one of the other three better, of course. But uh, in general, I think you want to use this ML super resolution, which is pretty cool. Good. Okay. huh? No, thanks. No, because I was trying it out and. Um I just did a zoom on something and it was still pixelated. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not, auto it. it's not automatic the first time, but I think the image resize uh, widget remembers what you used the last time on that computer. So if you ch change it to ML super resolution, then the next time it, oh, it it'll wow. default to that. Oh, yeah. this is cool. See what I mean? I know. Yeah, but, um, but at first I thought it crashed my machine. So it, it must take a bit of horsepower, which my machine is an older machine. At first, I, I, yeah, at first my machine was unresponsive because I guess it was doing some heavy lifting. Okay. Yeah. It, it, I think if you have a GPU, it would probably work faster would be my guess. Um, but I think your Mac mini has the on chip GPU. So it's, you know, not, not as efficient. So, yeah. Um, well, no, it has, it has the, uh, yeah, it has it has both discrete and oh, it does. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's just yeah. older. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I, it's fun. So anyway, there you go. Something fun to play with here for the holidays. Ben offers what uh, what I will say is a quick tip, but it's certainly a valuable one. He says, I just discovered that by holding shift and control down, the dock's magnification setting is temporarily reversed. He says, evidently, this has been around since Leopard, but he just learned about it. And Ben, you're not the only one. I just learned about it, too. So if you have your dock set not to zoom, but you want to zoom it, perhaps because you've got lots of apps open and now your dock is very compressed, just hold down shift and control and float over your dock and it will zoom. As Ben notes, it reverses the setting. So if you have it zoom and you don't want it to shift and control, will keep it from zooming uh, for that particular session there. Well, at least while shifting controller down. So thank you for that, Ben. Good little tips. Yeah. 
this is, I know, it's good, right? It's what I love about this show, John. I keep saying that, but, you know, it's, it's true. I get excited by this stuff. Yeah? Good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I want to talk about our next sponsor, which is Linode at L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash M-G-G. Years ago on this show, we got obsessed talking about how migrating from a spinning hard drive to an SSD would make your computing life so much better. It And it turned out to be very, very true. In fact, the entire industry has now moved this way, right? Because we weren't often taking advantage of the full capabilities of our CPUs because we were waiting for the spinning disk to either finish writing or reading the data that we were working with. SSDs changed that right now. We were able to use the full extent of our CPUs and all of that stuff, which was great. I tell you this because Linode has standardized on SSDs across their entire platform. That means no matter what server you get, you are getting the maximum speed out of this thing. And you're not dealing with latency like we described because everything is run on an SSD, even their lowest cost $5 a month server runs on SSDs. So you are avoiding the bottleneck that is the most common thing that slows down your server apps. Obviously, if you need more CPU, you can get more CPU. They scale all the way up to dedicated servers and everything. And you get to pick from one of their 10 worldwide data centers. It's fantastic what they do there. If you like the command line, absolutely. Sign up for your Linode server and get to the secure shell and you're good to go. If you don't like the command line or if you just don't care to use it for that particular session, no problem. Their cloud manager allows you to set up your server without ever even knowing about the command line, let alone touching it. You want to do a WordPress install? You just tell it. I want to do WordPress. It knows what to set up. You don't even have to know what Linux, Apache, MySQL, or PHP are. It takes care of all that and then installs WordPress inside it for you. You can do the same for a VPN server. You can do the same for a Minecraft server. You can do the same for all kinds of different servers because they already have built it. You've got to check it out. And as I said at the beginning of the show, using promo code MGG2019, you get a $20 credit, which, yes, if you've done the math, means that you could get four months for free of that $5 a month Nanode server with the SSDs, of course, because everything has them for free because of the $20 credit you get just for being a Mac Geek Gab listener. Linode.com slash MGG. Use promo code MGG2019. And our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, Mr. Braun. Shall we move on to uh, to the airing of the grievances of Apple Mail section here? Is that, is that, uh, that fit for you for our, our Festivus show here today? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do Feats of Strength, or, or that that's going to be in the next show. Oh, uh, that'll be in the post show. You've got to be in the chat room to uh, to experience that, <laughs> I think. I think that's that sounds, that maybe that's best. That's right. So, Leftwin writes, he says, this is beyond a mere fish shake. Following up on some comments over the past few episodes regarding Apple Mail and Catalina, it's time, he says, for a full airing of the grievances says, I have a dozen or so personal email accounts in Apple Mail and uh, several domains with multiple email accounts for each one. He says, with Catalina, here are my problems. And I, I, I can't answer all of these. If you can, there's one that I definitely have an answer for. Uh, so we can solve at least that. But if any of you, let's treat this as a geek challenge because that's what we do here. So if any of you have thoughts about this, feedback at macgeekgab.com. We'll get, uh, we'll, we'll compile them and, and see if we can't help left one and all the rest of us use mail and Catalina. So good. Feedback at macgeekgab.com. That's right. Feedback at macgeekgab.com. So the first he says, which I don't believe I have an answer for, I cannot keep the sidebar listing of my various mail accounts in priority order. I can reorder them by dragging them. So there's a tip for you. If you have mail accounts, uh, you know, if you twist open your inbox, you'll see all your multiple mail accounts. You can reorder those, uh, he says. But the reordering for him does not stick anymore. 
Earlier versions of mail, he says, has have the, had the same problem, but eventually it came to be some version several years ago that his preferred order would stick. This is no more. Okay, so that's problem number one for, for left when he says, I am getting the lost connection timeout all the time. Yeah, same left one. Most of my accounts, he says, are hosted in Google, and I expect it's a delay in security handshaking, as you mentioned in the previous episode. But come on, he says, give it a minute before flashing me with an error message. And the worst thing about it is the dialog box that comes up. Connection, doctor. Seriously, it's a terrible interface design in that I can only have the choice of going offline or run the connection, doctor, with no option of simply dismissing and trying it again. He says this is very un Apple like, you know, that's the best description of this problem that I have seen. It is very un Apple like. Why does mail fail like this? It it I mean, we it, anybody that's experienced this and I, I'm guessing it's a lot of us where you get the little triangle and mail says, oh, I can't connect. It's like, well, we know if we tell it to connect again, it's likely to work. I mean, unless something has happened with the mail server, but by and large, that's not the case. It's just that mail is, uh, has set its tolerance a little too low. So why doesn't it just try again? That's, that's the interesting thing. Now there might be a good reason for that. Maybe too many failed log. They're worried about too many failed logins, locking your account out or something like that. But clearly that's not the case. So yeah, I, I, I appreciate your, your, categorization of that it is un apple like uh he says uh, number three he says you've already addressed the fake column view he says which i also find infuriating why i ask what is the benefit to the user of this change another poignant question john um i i, I don't know that there is any benefit to the user of this change so yeah that's a good perspective uh, the next one, he says, have you found a way in Mac OS to change the default actions for right and left swipe on a message as you discussed last week? iOS lets you change the default action of a right or left swipe. Why not Catalina? Well, the good news is you can with Catalina. Um, if you go to. Uh, yes, go to mail preferences viewing. The second option there is move discarded messages into and you get to choose trash or archive. And in fact, that is what decides what your I believe it is right to left swipe. I don't have a trackpad available in front of me on this computer, so I can't confirm it. But I believe that's the right to left swipe. The left to right swipe lets you toggle red or unread on or yes. of course off. Am I yeah, I confirm this. Cool. Thank you. So, so that is the option of where you can set that is for, for better or for worse. So, yeah, good. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. kind of annoying that it's not as featured as iOS. Cause I thought yeah. their goal was to try to make them feature compatible. Cause you have a lot more options, especially with the uh, right to left swipe on iOS. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. Uh, maybe they'll add it in the next update. Uh, yeah, maybe. Right. That that's true. Like we have seen things, for example, the like I think we talked about this on the show, but if we didn't, uh, the, yeah, we did the music app when they added in the column browser. Right. That that was not ever in the music app. Of course, it was in iTunes for years and years, but uh, they put that into the music app in the most recent update, which is great. So so I, I feel like these things, you know, I'm hoping that the mail column view gets a uh, a regression back to what we had in Mojave um, because yeah the, the single mondo column is not really what we want but anyway yeah and and these things with mail the swiping I think I, I, I agree with you Th those could those could be made more feature compatible with iOS yeah he says uh, his last one he says finally the frequent complete lockups on updating the inbox with no feedback unless you happen to look at your phone and see a bunch of new emails in iOS that aren't showing up on your laptop. I think these, I, it, unless I'm misunderstanding him, I'm conflating. I, I, I would combine these two intentionally with the, that one and the lost connection thing. I feel like it's the same, certainly the same impact on the user where mail just stops. 
but we did see this last one on iOS up until I believe 13.3. Uh, right. Isn't that what we're on right now? Whatever the latest one is. Yeah. 13.3 uh, where iOS mail would just like, you wouldn't know that it wasn't updating. There was no error message thrown, but if you looked on your Mac, so the opposite of what left one is saying, uh, and you realized, oh, crap, there's a bunch of new messages here. If you, you know, force quit the iOS mail app by going to the task switcher and, and you know, swipe up and then relaunch it, you would get all those messages to appear. So, yeah. So he has a question, though, John. He says, what's my best viable alternative to Apple Mail? I want a native Mac OS app, not a web interface. Uh, he says, and I have not considered this option for many years. But what is what he calls the 2020 Thunderbolt uh, Thunder? Sorry, not Thunderbolt Thunderbird equivalent. Um, Thunderbird is still very much a uh, actively developed and maintained mail client. Uh, it is cross platform. It's built by the the Mozilla group, the people that make Firefox. And I, I've used it, in fact, you know, when I have like staff members leave or whatever, and I need to be actively checking their email for, you know, a few weeks to months or whatever, I will put that into a Thunderbird thing so that I can compartmentalize it because it lets you have multiple users and, and all of that. And it's just sort of separate um, and it and it works fine. The problem with it is that it and and and. <laughs> So the problem with it is that it is not Apple Mail. So all of the integrations that you get with Apple Mail go away. It is the good news about Thunderbird is that because it is cross platform, because it is maintained by the people that make Firefox, I don't expect it to go away anytime soon. I mean, it you know, it has been around for a long time. There are lots of people that use it. So that would be my first choice just because of its reliability. There are others out there and uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's worth checking out. I know Riedel makes a, a mail client. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Maybe some spark, spark is another one That's that it. I have. That's the I have one on my Mac. Yeah. So do you like spark? Do you use it at all? Um, haven't used it lately, but, uh, and I just started it up here and apparently it's uh, forgotten about me because it's asking for me to resubmit my credentials. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So but, um, I know a lot of people like Spark and. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, that 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 is a that is one of the more popular ones. My issue with I find it non-trivial to change mail clients, not that the change itself is a problem. In fact, these days with IMAP, it's it, it is quite trivial. You just put in your credentials and boom, you can have the same email even in four different clients running simultaneously. We see that all the time, even just with Apple mail on our various devices, right? It's, it's all in sync. It's great. But the workflow interruption and impact of moving to a new mail client is, uh, is a transition, right? You know, I, I do a lot of my work in email. I'm very efficient uh, in my email workflows. And right now I'm constantly working to improve that efficiency because I'm crazy. Uh, moving to a new email client, even a fantastic one. And I think all the ones that we've mentioned are fantastic ones is, uh, you know, it, there's a, there's a learning curve, right? And that will slow you down a little bit. So changing email clients every few weeks is not something that I can sort of afford to do. Uh, and I've been burned by email clients in the past that, you know, third party ones that, that, you know, come and go and that sort of thing. I, you know, like I said, I don't expect Thunderbird to go anywhere. Spark has been around for a while. The folks at Riedel don't seem to be going anywhere. So if that works for you, uh, then that's a good one. I think I, I would feel comfortable recommending that one. I, I found with email clients, it's interesting. You, I find that I think I learn more about the main developer of the client than I do with any other kind of app because people make email clients for themselves. And I don't mean to say that either, any of these are, are not, you know, listening to users. Of course they are. But the, the overall gestalt of an email client is driven by the, you know, the core developer of, of that client. And so if that person's, you know, worldviews and, and uh, on email, that doesn't have to be the rest of their worldviews, but if their worldviews and on email and, and their workflows match what you are looking for, then you are in heaven and it's great. Um, 
And if they don't, then it, you just won't like it. And that's okay. You know, it's, we're all different people. So anyway. Yeah. So yeah. here's a good sign is that, so I was trying to log into my iCloud account and this is, uh, it looks like Spark supports uh, one of the advanced features here. It said, I'd like you to create an app specific password. Yeah. That, that actually, I think that sucks. And I, I that's not Spark's fault. Um, you would have to do the okay. same with Thunderbird. This is iCloud does not allow any third party apps to use their um, their, uh, you know, OAuth style thing. So you can't do two factor authentication login with a third party email yeah. client with okay. iCloud, uh, which which sucks with Google. You certainly can they it, because it's open authentication. Apple's authentication is not open. It is only for Apple apps, which is yeah, a little bit of a drag. But but you have to do it if you're going to use iCloud email with with something like Spark or Thunderbird or anything that's not Apple Mail. So, but it but the, but Spark is good about as you as you're finding you know walking you through that process and all of that. Yeah. Go ahead. One thing I want to mention for for the first point that he made a suggestion though it didn't seem to work in my case but I mean in yours. Uh, about the sidebar stuff. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, logging in through the web interface may let you change it. I've had to do that depending on the. the no, host. he's he's not talking about that sidebar. He's talking about the sidebar. If you have multiple email accounts yes. uh, on Apple Mail and you twist open your uh, inbox. Right, right. right. And then you can you can move those around in there just by dragging. But you won't oh. be you, you it, that that's that's unique to that bill that, you know, that uh, instance of Apple Mail on that machine. Yeah. So speaking of. Um, huh. Oh, OK. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. OK. OK. I, 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 no, it, I seem to be able to do it. But then, yeah, it sounds like he doesn't or mail overrules him for some. Eventually reason. it overrules him. No, he said he can do it, but it, but it reverts back relatively quickly. Which which stinks. OK, so then I offered kind of a mini tip there because I've uh, I, I like to have my mail folders in a certain order. And sometimes yep. that doesn't work depending on their implementation. So sometimes, like I said, if you go to the web interface, you may be able to reorder your mail folders, whereas you can't mm. through mail for whatever reason. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, while we're on the subject here, this is kind of an important thing for all of us to plan for. If you are using Google Mail accounts, specifically Google G Suite accounts, so if you have one assigned to your domain, I don't think this applies to a Gmail account. So that's going to be our workaround. But if you have a G Suite account in 14 months, so February of 2021, G Suite accounts will not allow app specific passwords to log in to mail uh, CalDAV, CardDAV, or something else too. What that means is a lot of us, and this is very much true for me, Apple Mail doesn't support multiple from addresses with the standard Google OAuth two-factor secure login. Because of that, as we've mentioned many times on this show, we use IMAP to connect to, you know, we just treat our, our Google or Google suite or even our Gmail accounts as direct IMAP accounts, log in with a uh, app specific password, and then we can edit the from addresses in Apple Mail. So this is an Apple Mail limitation and, and using IMAP is the workaround. That workaround will go away forever starting February of 2021. Sooner than that, on June 15th of 2020, you can't add a new app specific password for those services. But if you already have one, it's grandfathered in until the following February. So just bear that in mind. Hopefully between now and then someone at Apple and maybe somebody's listening will add. All you got to do is add the ability to edit from addresses on Google accounts in Apple mail. It's all we need on iOS and on Mac OS. And all of this problem goes away. But um, but until then, we have a problem. And if we get to February 2021 and nothing has changed, what I'm thinking I would wind up doing if I stick with G Suite, which I've been thinking of moving to something like Fastmail for a long time. So maybe this is the catalyst. But um, 
what I would do is forward all the mail that comes into my G Suite account into a Gmail account that I can then check via IMAP with my various uh, various things. So so that that would be a potential workaround and, uh, you know, be that as it may. But currently, this is the problem. So just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah. Had you uh, you I'm not. Would you have gotten that that email, John? I can't remember if if uh, you you probably would have. But but anyway. Yeah. No, I'm I'm not. Well, you use it for your TMO mail for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because if you want to reply from like our, as you said, you know, the, 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 the Mac geek Gab addresses, including premium at Mac geek com for all of you who are premium listeners. So, all right. Well, on this subject of cloud-based services and iCloud and all of that, Michael has an interesting problem and I think I know what could I can only come up with one answer for this so I'm hoping it's right Michael says I've had an issue with a dress book for a long time and I have no idea how to fix it when groups is showing on the left hand side of the window I have iCloud showing twice if I add a new group it shows up in both sets of iCloud any changes are immediately visible in both sets I've tried signing out of iCloud and back in any idea of what's going on. So my first question to him was, if you go into uh, system preferences, iCloud and uncheck contents, do both of these disappear? Does only one? Is it showing the same thing twice or is it not? And the answer is that only one of them disappears when he unchecks contacts in iCloud preferences and that opened the door uh, because the question then becomes where else could you define a connection to iCloud? Because clearly there are two separate connections to what happens to be the same iCloud account. So where can you define them? Well, one place is, as we noted, system preferences, iCloud, and you can check or uncheck contacts. There's another place. If you go into system preferences, internet accounts, you can add a second or third iCloud account here, and it can't sync to everything that your main iCloud account can, but it can sync to many things and contacts is among that list. So I'm guessing that somewhere along the line, you added your iCloud account to internet accounts, and that's why you're showing two. And I would say, unless there's some reason to have it there, remove it from Internet accounts. You'll probably see two of them there. You should see one. We all should see one when we go to system preferences, Internet accounts. Uh, But if you see two, that would be the answer. So that's that's my thought on that one. Thoughts, John? Um. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I'm looking at I think on both my machines, I have iCloud in internet accounts and then it shows all the uh, services below it. So As it I should. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I would. Yeah. But if he has two of them here, this is the right. only yes, other place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is a handy thing. I mean, a lot of people have like people that want to share their contacts database with, you know, say their spouse or, a, a, a you know, a, a business colleague or whatever. Uh, have often used a second iCloud account to do exactly that, where you've just got, you know, everything that's in there is available to both people and you can compartmentalize it. Of course, you know, you can, you can only put some contacts in one or whatever. So it is a handy thing, but, um, but, you know, obviously like any technology, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing and, and manage it properly. So I'm guessing that's what, that's what this is. I'm hoping that that's what this is. Good. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, Yeah, I've got another one just kind of like this. Uh, JP writes in, he says, my wife's got an iMac brand new with Catalina. The mouse will not scroll in any direction with her finger. So I'm assuming this is a magic mouse. Great. Uh, But everything else about it works. He says, I created a second troubleshooting user. Good tip. Uh, And it works fine in that user. Other than reapplying the Catalina update, he says, which I'm trying now. Any suggestions? So I'm guessing reapplying the Catalina update won't work because this is a user specific problem. So start asking myself, where on our Macs are these settings stored? Right. Certainly 
You could go into system preferences, you know, mouse or trackpad or, you know, whatever the, the appropriate one is for you. But, you know, where else are these things? And of course, the answer, as many of you are probably screaming at your car radios and steering wheels, is accessibility. Sure enough, if you go to system preferences, accessibility, pointer controls, mouse options, dot, 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 there is a box that in if you have a mouse that can scroll, will say scrolling and it is probably unchecked. Because for accessibility reasons, there might be a time where you would want to not have the mouse scroll. If somebody isn't quite as dexterous with their hands or fingers, you turn that off so that they're not accidentally scrolling and, and screwing themselves up. So my guess is that somehow that got unchecked, recheck it, and you should be good to go. Yeah. Accessibility. Yep. It, it, this yeah, is a, that was my thought too. I, yeah. I, I, I think I told you one time I activated a what was it, mouse keys, which oh, all of yeah. a sudden made my trackpad appear to not work anymore, and that's because I had accidentally enabled mouse keys. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess the accessibility stuff so kind of takes over sometimes, as it should. And and there are some handy things in there that can be used, sort of, you know, um, but. but, but it, it off label, if you will. Right. You know, they're there for one reason. But if you know what they do, well, you can use that for any reason. But it's also good from a troubleshooting standpoint to go and take a look in there. Right. So. Yeah, I was doing also the preferences trick here, but I don't see that. And I was fiddling with my mouse settings on this machine, but none of the files that came up have the word mouse in them. So I'm. Yeah. Well, yeah. do you don't so have them. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, it's somewhere else, I think. Um, but yeah, well, it came up with like system preferences, not P list, which I don't, I don't think you want to whack that file. Well, um, maybe you do. I mean, in, in. Yeah, if you have to, you have to. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And for those of you following along at home, you will only see a scrolling checkbox there if your mouse or trackpad if your pointing device has the ability to do that kind of scrolling with the fingers. Otherwise, like on this machine, I've got an old razor mouse uh, that doesn't, you know, it's not a touchpad on it. So there is no checkbox for that here. So just, just FYI, if you're looking for it and you don't have that option in your hardware, it will not be there in the, or it will not be exposed in the software. So, all right. Uh, where are we here? What are we looking at? Let's see. Um, Mark says, I'm getting ready to do a nuke and pave on my 2013 Mac Pro for the first time. I know there has to be plenty of crap from all the years of just updating the OS. My question is, can I run migration assistance several times, slowly adding back files from my backup? Uh, he says, of course, first thing would be all my apps. But then what and what not to bring over at all? says, I have lots of applications purchased and installed from non-Apple store websites, so it's not just a get them from the App Store process. So, you know, this is one of those questions that my answer to it, as many things, has evolved over the years, but there's no definitive answer. Um, you certainly can run Migration Assistant after you've set up your Mac, but depending on what you run and how you bring it in, it may wind up putting it in a new user account. Um, applications, though, are separate from user accounts, so you might be able to bring those over after the fact. But applications aren't the biggest thing there, right? Um, I think the user, if you're going to bring over anything from your user account with Migration Assistant, my advice is to do that as part of the install. Uh, because you don't want it. You, know, you can do this, but I wouldn't want it creating multiple user accounts every time I, you know, tried to bring something new in and then having to sort of manually migrate uh, from there. But, you know, as to the more general question of what to bring over and what not to bring over uh, migration assistance, pretty good at not bringing over sort of obvious cruft. Now the problem is some cruft isn't obvious, right? If you're like me, you install a lot of stuff and then forget about it. Right. And then you don't want to move that over, but you don't even know what you don't want to move over. And while stuff like that does take up space, it usually 
doesn't take up any other resources like RAM or CPU uh, unless it has a running process. And looking in login items and then also checking like Lingon or something to uh, check the non-login items processes can usually help eliminate that stuff. And that's good to do even if you're not migrating to a new Mac or nuking and paving. Right. So my feeling on this, and I'm curious to get yours too, John, is, you know, pick one of two paths, either move over everything with a migration assistant or move over nothing. Right. And if you choose the latter, then you'll be migrating things over manually and you might well forget or miss something. If you choose the former, then you still have the option to intentionally go through and weed out stuff after you've migrated it over. Um, of course, you could do this before you migrate, but then you're eliminating your backup, uh, you know, in, in the shape of your previous system drive of whatever you had. So if you realize you need something now, where do you go to get it? I've done it both ways. Um, and when I set up the, this iMac here in the studio earlier this year, I decided it was time to start from scratch. This had been migrated from a power PC machine like like this installation. So it, it was it was well beyond time. Um, and, you know, with everything that's synced to the cloud and all of that nowadays, it really wasn't a bad process at all. It took me, what, maybe half a day. And this machine was up and running with all the crazy things that I need to record podcasts in here, which is, I mean, we all have our crazy stuff, but you know, my crazy stuff, I got up and running within, you know, a few hours. It really wasn't that bad. So, um, so that's me, but what do you think, Mr. Braun? Um, I mean, the, uh, the feature does give you some granularity. So I don't know. And I've done it in the past and I haven't had that user problem. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would, so, you know, it'll show you, um, applications, which I think in the past I have done. And then it shows your home folder and, and, uh, you know, the various contents there, um, that you may not want to bring all that stuff over. I don't know. And then they have an other files and folders and computer network settings. Um, I think the last time I used migration assistant, I think I did applications, other files and folders and, I think I did all three of those. And then I okay. was kind of selective about what I did from my home folder. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Most of the time bringing over an application without bringing over the home folder is fine. Uh, you won't keep any of your preferences, of course, but that's sort of the point. Uh, but your apps, generally speaking, will run. There are some apps where whatever they put in your personal library folder are you know, instrumental to making the app run. And in those cases, well, then the app won't run without perhaps the installer disks or, or what have you. So I think I, I seem to remember, and I can't remember if it was with the, I don't think it was the iMac in the office, which I did with migration assistant when I got the 2019 iMac down there. I think it was with my MacBook air that I wound up doing migration assistant twice with it. You know, I migrated over, I, I chose granularly to try and, you know, not inherit six years worth of the entirety of Cruft and then realized, eh, no, 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 no. And I went back to the drawing board and, and sort of redid it again. It was like, OK, yeah, this is much better. This is what I wanted. And, that, that you know, there's nothing wrong with that other than time. The uh, migration assistant's gotten really good, but the whole uh it creates an ad hoc connection, a Wi-Fi connection between or Ethernet uh, between the two computers. So it's not relying on your local Wi-Fi. It's like whatever the best of the Wi-Fi is in those two Macs, it's just going to blast back and forth between them and not clog up your your main Wi-Fi network or go through your router or anything like that, it's, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it, I've had it work flawlessly. So, yeah, it is good. It is good. All right. Moving on, Mr. Braun. Sure. Cool. Uh, Phil. Phil has two. I like these kinds of questions. They take us off the beaten path. Phil says uh, a fellow agent mentioned this new browser, and I was hoping to get your take on it called the Brave browser. Uh, he says also the same agent. I, I guess I could 
reveal that that Phil is a realtor. I know that kind of dispels the the thing. So we, maybe we'll forget that. He says this same agent sent me a YouTube video about replacing the thermal paste on my MacBook Pro. And could you comment on it to see if it is a worthy repair? All right. So we will take these two in order. The Brave browser is something I messed with uh, a few times. It is fast and it's interesting. They block ads, right? But they know that publishers get paid. You know, when you visit a website, it's not free, right? Visiting a website means you agree to watch the ads that that particular publisher has chosen to show you. That's the quid pro quo. Uh, well, with, you know, with anything that blocks the ads, well, you know, that's that's the end of it. The publisher doesn't get paid and, and the publisher gets screwed unless there's some other monetization model. Well, Brave has built their own monetization model with a reward structure where publishers can sign up in Mac Observer. We have signed up for it. I, I we haven't. Uh, there hasn't been enough data for me to say, actually, this is fair or, eh, you know, it's a nice attempt, but mm, probably not. I don't know where it falls. So I, I have no judgment on that, but it's, it's probably one or the other <laughs> uh, where they reward publishers based on the um, the the users that visit. So they are doing some sort of tracking in that regard. I'm assuming that it's not tied to any one person. Uh, it's just tied to page views and ads blocked or something like that. But um, but it is a fast browser. It's available for both uh, iOS and Mac OS. And it's like I said, it's fast. It blocks all the trackers and, and most ads and things like that. And like I said, you can um, earn rewards and uh, help publishers and all of that good stuff. So which is good. You know, it's a, it's the best model of this that I have seen. So uh, I don't use it. I still use Safari. I prefer it just for its ubiquity across Apple devices, uh, but um, but things like Brave help test out new ideas and paradigms and stuff. And a lot of those sort of things wind up filtering into what Apple does with Safari because they sort of care about all the same things. So, right. Thoughts on Brave, John, before we move on to thermal paste. Um, <coughs> no, I haven't really looked at it. Okay. No, my backup browser is typically, uh, and I've had this happen a lot. Um, pages that don't work in uh, in Safari work just fine in Firefox. Yeah, don't know why. Right? Yeah, for sure. And then my third choice is uh, Chrome, but it rarely gets to the point where a page doesn't work in either Safari or Firefox. So I wind up, I, I'm kind of the same. Although because we do so much with Google Hangouts, both for our, you know, we we have a a daily staff meeting that we use hangouts for with TMO and we use them for other things. Um, were you drinking water out of a Mac key cab water bottle just there, John? And we were hearing, <laughs> is that what that was? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Got it. So, so because we use hangouts so much, uh, hangouts only work properly in Chrome. Now they used to work kind of okay in Safari and that went away. So, um, so like Safari is weird with Hangouts. Sometimes you can hear the audio of some participants, but not all. I, like, I don't even understand how it gets there. But anyway, Hangouts works way better in Chrome. So that's the browser that that's now become my secondary browser because it's it, I'm running it fairly regularly, um, you know, just for that reason. It's a fine browser. It, it works quite well. And, you know, like we mentioned earlier in the show, the extensions library is is quite uh, vast uh, and so is firefox's but yeah yeah there, I, other than that john though i wouldn't pick a I, I don't really have a favorite between firefox or chrome so yeah and firefox uses that mozilla renderer which is not webkit so that's probably a good choice to use when um when you have a, a page that won't you know render properly in safari or whatever yeah. yeah, and I like um, the other thing I like Firefox for because I haven't found anything that does this on Safari is Firefox has several good plugins or extensions or whatever you want to call them that'll let you pull video off of a web page and hmm. put it in a MP4, I think. Hmm. <clears throat> what, what what plugins are those? Now, now the, 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 I'm an inquiring mind, both for myself and by proxy for everybody listening. What what plugins do you like with Firefox? All right. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. No problem. That's good. This is the beauty of this show. We can, uh, 
we can, you know, we can get things. Video download helper. Is that one of them? Do we need to teach John? Or video, video downloader professional. No, they changed the font that they use for this. Downloader professional. Okay. Yeah. What else? Is that, that's the one? Yeah, that, that's the one that, uh, that I last installed. Yeah, for, for some strange reason, Safari doesn't seem to have any video extraction extensions that okay. I've been able to find. Huh. I, um, yeah, uh, I found the one for, so the interesting thing is, you know, I mentioned how I search in Google Docs, especially while we're doing the, the show notes, and uh, the, the first iteration of video downloader professional that I found is for Chrome, of course, because... Uh, it exists for both, but I've now found it for, um, I think I've found it for Firefox. I'll let you confirm when you go through the show notes, whether that's the same one, but there you go. Cool. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that. Yeah. I, if I want to pull down videos from a web page, uh, there's a variety of things I use, but honestly, the one that I use the most is uh, YouTube DL. I believe it's called, Oh, I don't have it installed here on this computer. Uh, I, uh, it, it's a, it's a thing that I installed with homebrew. It's called YouTube dash DL. And, uh, and you just do that and then put the URL in. Usually I put the URL in quotes and then it just goes and finds it and slurps it down. But other people have mentioned better ones in, uh, in the past. So if anybody, if anybody out there has any to recommend, please let us know. Because I, I'm feeling like we talked about this recently and somebody was like, why bother with the command line? You could use this. And then it's like, oh, yeah, OK, probably uses the same basic engine. But I just installed it by typing brew space install space YouTube dash DL. So I'll put I'll at the very least put that in the uh, the, uh, you know, the, the old show notes there, because that's what we do. Yeah. And I remember back in the day, another trick. So some websites would. Uh, say, oh, no, we're only going to let you stream the video. You can't download it. Mm. If you dig through the source and you could find the name of the video, you know, like with a dot .mov or dot whatever type of video it is, and you highlighted that, you could then put that in the download portion of Safari and it would download it. That is less and less common these days. Though. Yeah, I do. Because I think they go through more effort to obfuscate that. Well, it's not so much hard. the it's not an effort to obfuscate. It's an effort to manage bandwidth. Uh, they put a player <laughs> in the web browser and then that player streams chunks of the video. It doesn't just try to slurp the whole thing down as fast as oh, it possibly I can. See. Right. Because we know that you're not going to watch the video faster than one X. I mean, maybe you'll watch it at two X, right? Like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, but otherwise the player can define what the fastest is. Good and it can all, right. Point. You know, okay. so you can manage bandwidth that way. Yeah. 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 Of course they could manage their download bandwidth, but then they may not. Well, but, but you want to be able to let kind of have it work dynamically. So if someone's streaming right. at one X, if you, if, if the player requests the video at 1.2 X, well, that is probably enough. I mean, I'm sure they've done tests on this to decide, you know, where to, where to do it so that you have a nice flow and there's no buffering and all of that. But if somebody's watching it two X, okay, well now we need to, you know, stream to that particular client at 2.3 X or whatever, you know, whatever it works out to be. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. It sounds like you almost run a website that, uh, that, that uh, serves up video or something. Like it's that. one of those things. Well, the nice part is that the, we do obviously, but the nice part is the engines that are out there take care of this. Like YouTube just does this naturally. Um, Vimeo does this naturally. It's part of like it, that I, I think of that as delegating expertise. Like they're the people that's their thing. So we will pay them and use their engine because they are going to stay on top of it far more than we would if we wrote our own. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, for the second item. Yes. Right. So this video that, that he sent on YouTube uh, was explaining how to crack open your MacBook Pro and replace the thermal paste on it. And these exist. I, I would think the most popular one that I've seen is for the, the 2018 Mac minis. But you certainly, you know, there, there are folks that believe there's reason to do this with the MacBook Pro. So let me explain the concept of why, what the problem is. On your Mac, there's the CPU and it gets hot. 
and there's some sort of heat dissipation uh, system in there. And the idea is that you need to transfer the heat from the CPU to whatever this heat dissipation system is. We'll call it a heat sink, but that may or may not be the right term, but that's mm, close enough, right? I think that's the right term. Okay. So the idea is, you you know, you transfer the heat from the CPU to this heat sink, and then the heat sink has some uh, more efficient way. Perhaps it's got like fins so that as air passes across it, there's more surface area and, and you can dissipate more heat faster, right? The trick is you want as much heat from the CPU to dissipate to that uh, heat sink as possible or to transfer to that heat sink so that then the heat sink can can slurp it away. Apple does not use enough of or the right kind of paste that lives between. If you just put the heat sink on top of the CPU, some heat will transfer, but you can get more to transfer if you put this paste in there that really sort of glues the two together. Now, it doesn't actually glue them. It's they are removable. But the paste ensures that this process is happening. It makes it more efficient. And as I said, some folks feel not, and they have tested and they're not wrong that Apple uses a, a, a not enough and the wrong kind of thermal paste. So the idea is if you take things apart, remove the heat sink from the CPU, wipe off all the thermal paste that's there and put new thermal paste on, things can be more efficient. And when things are more efficient, your CPU can run faster because your CPU, especially in your MacBook Pro and your 2018 Mac Mini, will throttle down when it gets too hot. And that's sort of the time when you would want the CPU to throttle up, not down. So folks have replaced the thermal paste on these things and then, you know, done before and after benchmarks. And this video that, that he shared with us, which I'll put in the show notes just so we can all kind of have the same point of reference, talks about, uh, you know, kind of shows some of these tests. And it really it can make a difference. You know, we're talking it's we're not talking anything astronomical, but it's, you know, five to maybe 10 percent uh, of a boost. This really matters when you're doing something where the CPU is going to be running at or close to full tilt for a long period of time, right? Like, you know, video rendering or, huh. or any of that, right? Where where the heat, it, it's going to build up enough heat that you want to kind of, you know, keep dissipating it so that the CPU can stay hot. Okay, because that was my thought, because if your CPU, uh, yeah, unless you're on a edge, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Unless you're running really hot, I, I would see little benefit in doing this. Correct. Uh, Correct. I mean, maybe you'll save power in that the fans won't be drawing as much juice. Um, right. I, I, I would be uncomfortable because, number one, you're fiddling with the CPU. So, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, uh, use proper procedures like wear a grounding strap and all that. And there is the potential that you could ruin everything if you're fiddling around in there and, you know, zap something or. Did you watch the video that, no, I that did not. he sent in? It, it's worth watching to make that decision for yourselves, folks, because it really if you're comfortable opening up the machine, the rest mm -hmm. of this process really isn't that big of a deal. So if you would open up your machine to say, you know, replace the SSD in there or, or any of the other various things that we've opened our machines right, right. for over the years, if you're comfortable doing that. The the steps that once it's open, you would take to sort of unscrew the heat sink, wipe off the thermal paste, put new thermal paste on and rescrew the heat sink are basically as simple as what I just described. There's not you're yeah. not taking the CPU off that soldered to the motherboard, you, you know, like that. None of that is is happening. It's just you're just unscrewing the heat sink. You're cleaning off some thermal paste. You're putting some new thermal paste. Right. On, you're screwing the heat sink. No, I, I've done this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, not on my machine, but, you know, in other worlds, I've, you know, done stuff with thermal paste and heat sinks and all yeah. that. And it's, uh, you know, it's just you're taking a risk that. Uh, As always, uh, I, I, would, I would say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, but that's the thing is some people are 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 very much saying that it's broke. Right. Wrong thermal paste. And the one argument. Or maybe aging thermal paste. I, I don't know. I mean, would Apple use the wrong thermal paste? I don't think they're using yeah. enough of the right thermal uh, paste. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's there, just there could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, a tube of the right thermal paste will run you about six U.S. dollars. Uh, so and you would probably have enough 
for the rest of your life, you're just not using very much of this stuff. You know, it's I mean, we're talking about a thin layer of paste across the CPU. So a tube of it, you know, if you think of like a half size tube of toothpaste or something like how much paste would it take to have a thin layer and not much. So uh, but one other concern that people have is that a CPU, even one that's not even if you're not looking at the best performance out of it, uh, if your CPU is running hotter than it should be, well, then its lifespan may be reduced because of that. So having better thermal paste, having, uh, you know, the ability to dissipate heat better, mm, arguably might extend the life of your computer. You know, so mm-hmm. that's that's the that's sort of the the, you know, the, the oh, yeah. The and I remember actually it. looking at this for uh, most any processor has this feature, but most processors have some sort of input. That is the temperature of, you know, some sensor nearby and they, they will turn off if they get too hot. Yeah, it's a feature of almost any processor. So oh. they don't destroy themselves because they will. If, if it gets too hot, it's it, it will <laughs> oh, yeah. We had that problem with Lisa's Mac Mini. We have one of those um, we have one of those 12 South uh, uh, Mac Mini stands like the high rise, I think. Uh, and the, maybe it's the high rise pro high rise deluxe. I got to look at, at 12 South. Mm, no, I will find it so that I can link to it here. But um, the it, it's a great little thing that you can put all kinds of uh, different, you know, things inside. It's a high rise pro it's built for an iMac, but I had talked to them and they were like, yeah, you can put a Mac mini inside there. No problem. Well, this was basically like the day that the new, you know, Mac minis came out last year in 2018. And we got Lisa, the I seven one, which, you know, has a faster, hotter processor in it. And this putting the Mac mini inside this, it fit, uh, it looks like there's enough airflow for cooling. And once a day, her computer would turn itself off because it got too hot. Uh, so I opened the doors on it and the problem has not. And, and I also used iStat menus to start monitoring the heat and, you know, make sure that we were operating within good parameters. And uh, opening the doors gave it enough ventilation that everything was totally fine. But um, but yeah, it was just an inch. And, and I love this high rise pro because it keeps everything nice and contained and you can set a monitor on top of it. It did. It, it's really kind of a nice little it's a nice little compact thing. It, it looks like it's built for a Mac mini to use. And in a sense, it is. But, um, you, you know, you just got to you got to monitor your heat flow. So instead of putting a fan in it, we just open the doors and it's been fine. So, yeah. And sure enough. Yeah, I, I was asking myself this question, but I kind of answered it. iStat menus will send you a notification if uh, a temperature gets above a certain point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can have it for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that one of their nice. default notifications or, or uh, uh, is it just no, one you can configure? It, it doesn't. But it, yeah, it's an option I'm looking right now. Yeah. And so, you know, you choose temperature sensors and then you can do any temperature above or any of the individual temperature sensors in within the machine. Which, yeah. Uh, usually right. there are several. Yeah. Cool. 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 All right. Um, where are we here? we got all kinds of stuff. We've got some tips. Where are we on time? Man, man, it has been fun. Well, I will share Dimitri's tip because it is a handy one for us all to know. Uh, he says to help other listeners not get caught. He says, I rely on text expander a lot on my Macs and iOS devices. And I recently got myself an iPad pro with Apple's smart folio keyboard. I then quickly found out that text expander doesn't work with the hardware keyboard, which was, which was confirmed by their tech support. In fact, it's not just text expander. It's any third party software keyboard, uh, which of which text expander is one do not receive keystrokes from hardware keyboards such as Bluetooth keyboards or anything like that. Uh, and you know, it's interesting. I use uh, the, the bridge keyboard on my iPad pro and it's, uh, it's fantastic. I love them. Uh, but I, I, this is certainly the case with that one too. I never even thought about it because 
I would go and invoke the keyboard and there's the text expander keyboard on the screen. And I would just type on the screen and, you know, do my little shortcut and then hide the keyboard and then back to the my normal typing. I never live in the text expander keyboard. I just invoke it for the one little snippet. And then I like the iOS keyboard with its, you know, predictive text and all that stuff. So I don't even think about it. But but he's he's totally right. So just bear that in mind, folks, as you are, uh, you know, as you're doing this stuff. So. Yeah. Thank you for that. Heads up, Dimitri. Very, very good. Very, very good. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a one more tip. Yeah. In the last show, we were talking about the handshakes. In fact, at the last few shows, we've been talking about the handshake issue with Mac, specifically the Mac Mini, because it is a Mac that needs a display. Uh, with third party displays and all of that. And listener Jamie uh, has been using his Mac mini with a 4K TV monitor, a 49 inch display. Uh, and he says it is connected to the TV via HDMI, but he's had some uh, some wake from sleep issues which is what we've been talking about where the computer seems to be on, but the monitor says, mm, I'm not seeing any signal. And he says, sometimes he sees something on the display that's corrupt or the colors are way off. Uh, but typically he says the scenario is that the, dis- the computer has gone to sleep hours ago and stopped driving the display. And then the TV will notice that it hasn't had any input and also turn itself off. He says, uh, then I wake it up. And of course, here's the problem. So he developed two workarounds, one that is in the moment and then one that is preventative. The in the moment one is to hit command option eject hotkey to put the system to sleep immediately, wait a few seconds and then wake it up again. This gives you a quick retry of the wake up sequence and maybe, you know, and for him, that's worked. So that's interesting. And, and it fits into our handshake Uh, discussion from last week where it might be that the computer is not powering the GPU on because it doesn't see a display on the other side of things. So that's, that's sort of worth keeping in mind. So command option eject, if you have an eject key is the shortcut for putting the system to sleep and then you can wake it back up and see if now that the display has had a chance to sort of, you know, get its bearings, maybe now the Mac sees it and, and syncs up properly. He says, I've also developed a preventative workaround He says, I've come to believe that if I turn the TV on first and then wake up the computer a few seconds later, all will be well. And he says, I've had far fewer problems since I learned this. So thank you for sharing that, Jamie. This is helpful, helpful advice because it it really does make sense that it's the Mac that's not even attempting. It's not seeing a display. So then it decides not to try and drive one at all. And that Hmm. that's kind of yeah, I think that's the that's the thing. So, yeah. Good. Well, my friends, uh, I think we have come to the end. I think that's just how it's going to have to be for today, John. Why am I only hearing that in one ear? Are you mm. hearing? Are you hearing the music, John? Yes. What's weird? It's very, very left balanced, and I'm not sure huh. why that is. Do, do I have like a weird? It's a mono signal. Uh, it's really weird. I don't know why I'm only hearing it that way. Huh. Well, I will try and pan it, but that doesn't make any sense. It all should be mono. Huh. What's wrong? Ah. Aha. There we go. There was an analog problem. Okay. Well, oh, thank goodness we found it. Plugged in all the way? Uh, you know, I think it was just a, a like all the dry air. All I did was twist the RCA or the quarter inch cable that's going into the mixer and, mm. and everything was, was fine. So, you know, that's how these things go with, when you're dealing with analog stuff. So I can have John go to the, the mixer digitally, but the music, there's only one digital channel. Well, actually, there's two digital channels into the mixer, but they both go it's a left and right into one fader so i i could go from there and route around but i don't bother so the audio goes analog out from the mac to the mixer and then of course captured back in it's fine i'd rather have your audio without any analog noise and and deal with it for the band this is what these are the things that i think about john i care you know we care 
We do. And we thank you for listening. We are very appreciative of all of you, all that you do for us. Thank you for all of our premium listeners. Uh, there really weren't. We have no grievances to airy with, with any of you. It's just the grievances about mail. We don't even have grievances with each other. And we've known each other a long time. Maybe we do have some grievances. Maybe we'll we'll air them while we're at uh, at CES, John. We can we can uh, we can do that because we're going to CES soon. Right. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah boy. <laughs> uh, if CES. Yeah. We, have, you, have you gotten any emails about uh, anything? <laughs> my my schedule has. The, the funny part for me is the, the e- emails that come in now that are like, you know, and we're talking about December 23rd or whatever, where people are like, hey, you want to come meet with us? It's like, dude, my schedule has been full for three weeks. Like, oh, what right. what part of it? Like, you are late to the game. I always leave time for the important people at CES. Like, there's always room in my schedule, but, but oh, you right. know, the, the by and large, I know exactly where I'm going to be. I, I certainly know where I'm going to be uh, every every day. I sort of chunk my day up into three things: morning, afternoon, evening. And I mm-hmm. know uh, even before I start booking appointments, I know okay, this morning I'm going to be at like the Sands, and then this afternoon I'm going to be at the. You know, mm-hmm. South Hall, whatever it is, like because otherwise you lose all your time trying to travel around from place to place. So, yeah. oh yeah, no, no, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, it's yeah. just uh, you know, I still get things, and it's like, oh yeah, this th- these guys are in the same place that I'm going anyway. So, right. you know, you right, know, I'll add you. I'll add yeah, you. Yeah, you got to my... you got to yeah. triage or, or whatever. Otherwise, you, you'll you'll be lost. <laughs> You're lost. I, Absolutely. I found I found that out my first year going to CES. It's not a show you can just walk around like Macworld Expo or no. you know, no. Pepcom or Showstop. Well, actually the ones the Pepcom and the Showstoppers that they have at uh CES are huge. Oh yeah, to the ones that even they have for, out in Manhattan. Even for those, I have my lists of people that I'm going to see. Uh, I've already gotten like they they tell us what they're going to be announcing so that we can sort of decide do we want to um you know, is there something worth covering? So like I already know I think oh, nice. what I'm going to be telling you folks about from CES. Not everything, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's um it's definitely you know part of it. So and uh, while we're talking about it, our CES sponsors for this year uh, include a lot of folks who are coming back to help us uh, make all of the coverage that we do possible. What we do at CES is, you know, it, it, it's already started, as we just described. We there's so much there. You couldn't possibly learn about everything and you probably don't want to. So when we go to CES, we see our job as to be your filter, right? And and that process has obviously already started where we're filtering through stuff. And then while we're there, still filtering through and only reporting on the things that uh, we think would be of interest to you. Of course, we've sort of self-selected each other because the things that interest you are at some level the things that interest us. That's why we that's why we all like this podcast together, right? Because it's we th- we have shared interests. Mm-hmm. So uh, so we, you know, we provide those filters and then we bring the content to you, but it, it's, it does take some time and of course expense and all of that good stuff. So, uh, our sponsors this year, uh, we are happy to welcome back four returning sponsors, which is fantastic. iMazing, Otherworld Computing, Text Expander, and Carbon Copy Cloner. And I am totally stoked to have every single wow. one of them on board. I know it's great. It's a quality list there. I couldn't agree more, my friend. Yeah, you could. It's great. You could try. <laughs> I, I could try. Yeah. No, it's yeah. I'm, I'm stoked about it. Yeah. And in this year at, at CES, John, you know, when the uh, hotel rooms came out, like, you know, in June or whatever, I was I was going through it all and I, I patted myself on the back. Because as soon as we got home from CES last year, I got online and I started looking at hotel prices. We like to stay at the Mirage. It's a good central location for the type of stuff we cover. And uh, and I started looking and I realized that at that point in time, it was cheaper to buy a two bedroom suite at the Mirage for five nights than it was to buy two individual rooms and i thought okay well i will book us a two-bedroom suite john so that we have a living room between our two bedrooms and then i figured well when the you know when the prices when the actual ces blocks come out in uh, in like june or whatever we'll take a look and it'll probably be cheaper and we'll cancel the suite turns out they were uh they were a little cheaper in that the two rooms uh through the ces block would have cost us the exact same amount of money 
as our two bedroom suite. So uh, we're staying in a two bedroom suite, John. And uh, wow. but but it's actually the economical choice, and it gives us a living room so that we can. Uh, and be in a kitchen at type thing and all that stuff. So yeah, we're gonna be living large there. Uh, oh wow! But so economic more for less. It's more for I know. It's right. Really, it really is. When we went there with our kids, uh, whatever it was, last two summers ago or oh, something. Oh yeah, you told me you did that with the family. We too. did the same thing, and it hmm. was it was the same price at that point, which is what sort of got the wheels churning for me for for CES this time. So. Um, so anyway, you know, so I booked a I booked us a suite, which it's it, it it's fan. I love that we can do that and save money. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. So what else do we do? We got like a butler or a masseuse or. You know, I, no. I I would assume that we could <laughs> hire the services of all of the above and more uh, to come to our suite and do whatever we like. But um, I don't necessarily want a butler. I, a massage, you know, at the end of the day, that that sounds like a good idea. Probably cheaper to go down to the spa uh, at the Mirage and, and get that done, but that that's, now you're now you're talking, my friend. So, well, you know, at pretty much every trade show I've been to, they have at least one bunch that does massage. That's true. Yeah, yeah on the show floors somewhere. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, good. Anyway, there we are. Uh, that took us longer than 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 our our normal uh, out yeah. time so yeah. i will say thank you to everyone for listening we already told you how to find us we would like to thank of course linode for sponsoring this episode at linode.com slash mgg and then uh our our stable of mgg sponsors that include uh, of course smile and other world computing that we mentioned are sponsoring us for cs ces Barebones software, eero.com slash mgg, and lots more. Thank you so much to everybody, and uh, and we'll see you one more time before the new year. John, before we go, do you have anything to share? Uh, I, don't, I don't want to share. Okay. Now I'll share some good advice, especially this time of year with uh, all the holidays, uh, about to start. That's right. Yeah. Don't. Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas and, and all of that Whatever good stuff else. to everybody yeah. out there. Yeah. yeah. Happy week. But the advice to all of you, 